could be. All right, good morning to those that are here at Faith Family Chapel and those that are joining us online. We are here every Sunday at 10 o'clock. You're welcome to join us. We are in the book of Timothy. Uh, we are in chapter 3 this morning. So I'll be opening with the scripture. It comes from Matthew 24. Matthew 24 says, At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. Father, we thank you for the words you've left behind. We ask that our hearts and ears are open as we listen to them this morning and apply them in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If anyone says you look over there as the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. Because false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So this is Jesus Christ talking to his disciples when they asked him, well, what's, gonna be, what's it going to be like at the end? And he basically tells them straight up, false messiahs and prophets will appear and perform great signs. Not for nothing in our lifetime, false messiahs and false prophets have appeared and have basically done great signs to deceive even the elect. What are you talking about? Yeah, the faith healers that are out there, the people that say you can get wealthy and rich, all of these things would be, at that time when Jesus was speaking, great wonders and great signs. And it says they're so powerful that even the elect could possibly be deceived. So it's already happening. We just don't call them false prophets and false messiahs. We, we call them teachers and pastors and very religious people that are, you know, valuable to the Christian community, and that's just not the truth. That's not the truth, and we were warned to keep look for them, and I think as an American culture, for sure, we have, uh, you know, chosen a blind eye toward all of this. We're going to end, uh, start where we ended in 2 Timothy 2, and it says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who is taking them captive to do his will. Now, when I read that, you can kind of go, oh, I'm just supposed to be nice. This is a charge to Timothy, the pastor of the church. It's kind of like, Tim, by the way, as I told you in the first letter I sent to you, you need to tell those people that are teaching false doctrine to stop. And he's repeating himself. You need to tell them to stop. So my responsibility as a, you know, pastor, teacher, elder, leader of a church, I'm supposed to tell any of those that I run into that are teaching false doctrine to stop. It's not an option. See, it's not, it's part of the, what we talked about last week where the Mark Driscoll guy got up and talked to the congregation. That he, it was a men's meeting. He was invited to come in and they had what he considered to be something that was inappropriate for a men's meeting and he called it out and then they told him to get off the stage. And then there were arguments that went on and on. And, and the position that he had was, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, if something is wrong, I have a responsibility to call it out. That is my role in life if I'm obeying Paul's authority. We're supposed to do that. Why? So that I'm going to save myself, and the hearers that hear me correct those things will also be saved. The churches today are not churches. See, a church is a family it's a family. It's a community. It's why we want to stay together as a very small group, or we want to stay together as a very large group, because we're family. It's not, if you leave, or you go away, or, you know, something happens to a member of our family, it's painful, mm -hmm. right? It's supposed to be. That's the way God designed the church. There's supposed to be this deep relationship that you build with one another, and the reality is in most churches, they have no idea. That's why sin is so rampant, they have no idea what's really going on because they don't care. They're not interested. All, you know, if you come and look the part, we're good. As long as you don't go off the, the deep end, we're good. That's not a real church. But that's what the counterfeit church has become here in the United States. 
you know, and his first defense on this, well, but yeah, they're, they're so successful and they have so many people and they do so many, and I'm, that, that's not, I have a little tiny church, but I know everybody in my church. I know what they're about. I know what they believe. We have discussions about it. If they're off, I talk to them about it. There's no, they get to go think what they want because it's not how it's supposed to be. If they don't like what we think here, they have the freedom to go find a church where it fits their need. But we have to tell them what we believe the truth of the matter is at all times. Deal with these folks. You've got to deal with these people. It's not just about their um, salvation you're dealing with. It's about those that are listening to them, those that they have the ability to have an influence over. You have to deal with them as well. And so he goes into chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, and he says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days, People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Mark this. Pay attention. This is going to happen in the end. The the, the, uh, there will be terrible times. People will be lovers of themselves. Pride. Pride is the greatest sin that a Christian can have. Pride. Let me give you, let me give you a little bit of stats. You can read them up here. Do you know that the average number of selfies worldwide that are taken on a daily basis is 92 million selfies? 92 million selfies. Not pictures of other things, <laughs> just a picture of yourself. 92 million selfies a day. That's 34 billion, with a B, billion selfies a year. And out of those that are taking the selfies, the percentage of 18 to 34-year-olds account for 82%. 82% of that age group are responsible for 34 billion selfies a year. And the estimation is that each individual spends 38 hours a year just taking selfies of themselves. 38 hours a year. Now, when I grew up, believe it or not, we didn't have phones that were capable of selfies. We didn't have phones. What did we have? Deanna would always, as we were dating younger, she'd always bust my behind on the mirror. <laughs> You're always looking at yourself in the mirror. You're always looking at yourself in the mirror. Yeah, I want to look good. <laughs> so it's not like it's new, but we just didn't have a vehicle to make it explode, to allow our pride to explode so emphatically. Today, the enemy introduced the cell phone. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of great things about the cell phone. However, if the tool is used improperly, it's a bad tool. It's a bad tool. And it not only gets to the point, I didn't put some of the other details here, but, you know, we're taking 92 million selfies per day. Do you know how many, how many uh, out of the 92, multiply that by four, we, we look at our own selfie. So if there are 92 million selfies being put up, we individually look at our own selfie as many as four times per selfie to make a decision of whether we like it. And if we don't like it, we put up another one. It's all about us. It's all about the individual. When you look at what was going on this week on our college campuses with some of the most elite colleges in the United States or the world, some would say, it's all about them. If you, that age group. And that age group. That age group is the first sign of the apostasy. It's the first sign that tells you we have a generation of individuals who don't know God. A first sign that we have a generation of individuals who don't know Jesus Christ, who have no idea what's coming for them, who have believed the lie of the enemy and have begun to turn away from God in droves. They're the ones turning toward, you know, transgenderism and all of this. It's not the older groups. It's the younger group, that 18 to 34-year-old. 
Now, we'd all like to think that, well, they'll grow out of it. And the answer is no. The foundation of what you're taught as a very young person is what stays with you forever. God says, teach them all the time. Teach your children so that when they grow up, they'll have a foundation of all of the things you taught them about me, and it will go well with them. Well, if they're not learning, they're not growing. And at the end, when they are tested, they will fail the test. Because the whole idea behind this grouping has nothing to do about, you know, so I, I was with a, an older person, uh, and we were talking about the 60s when they were, they were protesting the Vietnam War. Okay, a completely different type of, it was still a protest, it's still a lot of people, there was a little bit of skirmish here and there, but for the most part it was a peaceful protesting about a specific thing that had value. These individuals are protesting about something that has no value, and the reason is is because their life is based on turmoil. If there is no turmoil in their life, they do not feel connected to the population. And so it doesn't matter what it is. When you listen to them, they started off talking about, well, it's about, you know, Israel should stop bombing Hamas. I'm all for that, to be honest. I think they should find some sort of resolution that works. Hamas could just give back all of the people they took. That would be a good sign, but they choose not to, right? But it wasn't only that. If you listen to their demands, then it became, and we want you to divest of all of all investments that you put in Israel. And we want you to stop driving big trucks that are ruining our, our uh, you know, ozone layer. And we want you to stop eating animals and everybody should be vegan. And, do you see what I'm saying? But the most Right. And then after all that, we wanted, you know, most of them were like, th the schools were negotiating with them. Like Brown University was negotiating with their people. We're going to negotiate. And what was one of the negotiations? Well, at the end of all of this, we want, we want to be able to be, you know, not held accountable for this. You can't, you can't prosecute us or you can't persecute us. You can't whatever. When the, to be honest, I was, you know, a young man during, that, during the Vietnam deal. Those people weren't like, at the end, you don't have to. They didn't care. This whole thing is just telling you what's beginning to happen in our culture. So we're not that far away. What Paul is saying to Timothy is not that far away. They're going to be lovers of themselves. We've already proven that. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive. That's clearly what we saw this week. Disobedient to their parents. Yeah, if my kid was involved in that and then public, you know, putting his face or her face up on TV, I'd have been ripped. Okay, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers for the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So that's what's coming in the last days. Is there an individual in this room that cannot see this is already here? It's already here. So if it's already here, then the last days must be upon us. Well, let's listen to how he talked about it in Romans. Okay, we're going to be in Romans 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, but because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuses. Paul's basically saying, look, there was no, no, you couldn't miss God. There's no missing God or a God. So no one has an excuse. And he goes on, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. And if you saw this week, all of the college kids had signs and they had headbands and they had, you know, decorated statues and they did all of this nonsense. Therefore, so this is what it, Paul says when that happens. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for de degrading the, of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. So when these things take place, we talked about this a while back 
when, you know, what happens when God's wrath is on a country or, or on a people. He says the first thing that, the first sign that's going to happen is we're going to give them over to sexual impurity. The, the whole transgender thing exploded. It went from a concept to a full-out war in a matter of three to four years. Exploded. They exchanged the truth about God. There is only a man and only a woman for a lie. And they worship the, the created things. I'm going to worship the ecology, and I'm going to worship global warming, and I'm going to worship vegan food, and I'm going to worship all these other things, solar and the Green Deal, and all this other stuff other than God. Other than God, right? So he continues on in Romans, he says, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So you're going to see God in action. When God exists, and oh, look, I... I I know we have some young people here, but listen to me. When you have a desire to do something that is not godly and God exists, you have a much better way of avoiding that sinful desire, whatever that is. But the moment that sinful God is taken out of the equation, you give in to your own wants, needs, and feelings. And according to God, that leads to shameful lust. That leads to having an abnormal sexual relations. Those are the things that happen when God is not part of your life. So when you see people in this kind of environment, we see them all over, but when you see them, have pity. God is not part of their life. So what can you do, Christian, to help bring God into their life? I can tell you one thing you shouldn't do is avoid God in their life and say, well, that's okay, or, you know, God doesn't care, or whatever. No, 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 no. <laughs> God does care. These are the things God thinks, and you can avoid these things by focusing on God. Verse 28, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they ought not to be done. He gives them over to a, so, so the moment you pull God out of the equation, they go over to a depraved mind. Well, what's a depraved mind? We are Hamas. We are Hamas. It's okay for them to go into Israel, take babies, put them in ovens, and to burn them to death, and then put it on YouTube or TikTok or whatever, and be rewarded for that, or rape grandmothers, or behead or whatever and ever. It was brutal. And the reason that this is so unfathomable to me personally is because it's not only that it's brutal, it was public. They publicized everything. You know, the Nazis didn't publicize anything. They hid everything, and they were outrageous what they did. It wasn't until after years, decades later, that we really understood the atrocities of what they committed to their family, fellow man. Hamas? Right out front. Right out front. Well, why? God gave them over to a depraved mind. It's okay. They're not human beings. They're not people. They don't deserve love, care, and honor. That's what happened when God is removed from the equation. Verse 29, they be. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. i got to be honest with some of the things that came out of the, the Israeli-Hamas conflict. I would have never guessed that we were capable of doing some of these things. I would have never guessed that the Nazis were capable of doing some of these things. I would never guess that the Japanese in their conflict were capable of doing the things that they did to human beings. But that's what happens when there's no God. 
They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. And that's the warning Paul gave to his you know, fellow believers in Rome. Yeah, it's not only the people that do these things, folks. It's if you approve of them doing it. Well, love is love. Well, it's okay. No, 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 you know. Your heart is always being tested and watched by God. If you approve of the stuff that you see going on, you're in deep do. You're in deep do. And so that's the warning. So Paul continues on in his, in his uh, note to Tim. He says in uh, verse 5, These people have a form of godliness, but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. Have nothing to do with such people. Meaning, listen, if your friend groups are these kind of folks, Paul says, have nothing to do with these kind of people. Nothing. Well, that's not fair. Well, they're nice. And just because they don't believe the way I believe, that's not a problem. No, it is, Christian. It's a problem for you because you're not part of their group. And Paul says, don't have anything to do with those people. Now, did he say hurt them, uh, you know, persecute them, attack them? No, he doesn't say any of that at all. He just says, you're not part of my groovy gang. Let's just, you know, we're good. I have a rule of thumb in regards to my friendships. If you call me a friend and you don't treat me like a friend, I'm going to call you, you're not my friend. (laughs) Don't get angry. You're just not my friend. Don't be mad at me because I'm honest with you. You're not my friend. Friends don't do that. If that's what you think friendship is, then you're insane, and I'm not going to surround myself with insane people. You get the idea? That's the same idea. Matthew 7, 15, Jesus warns us already, beware of false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They're going to walk and talk and look nice. They're going to look religious. They're going to talk religious. But in the back, they have no plan. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in in the word of God being right. They don't believe that we should follow that. We'll talk about it if it works and it feels good, but we're not going to apply it. That would be crazy. Verse 6, they are the kind that worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Do you know when, what is, I mean, it's, all right, it may, it may be my opinion, but the number one thing that destroys mega churches is the male pastor is having improper sexual relations with female congregants. Always. That's, I never hear a male pastor killed someone. <laughs> I never hear a male pastor you know, went off the deep end and did something else. It's always sexual immorality that causes the destruction of their church. In the last four or five years, we've had all of that kind of stuff happening. These are the false teachers. They're not there for the right reason, and because they're not, they prey on the gullible women of their congregation, women who trust them, women who want to believe in them, women who see them as a leader. They would never expect you to take advantage of them. We've talked about in Africa, one guy actually I think is going to prison now because you know, he would tell his congregants that, oh, God said that I need to take you out in the field and have my way with you. And women by the droves were going every day out into the field. And they finally dealt with him. Jude 1 says, For certain men have crept in among you unnoticed, ungodly ones who were designated long time ago for condemnation. They turn the grace of our God into a license for immorality, and they deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Did you get that? They have crept in unnoticed because they were designated long ago. That's the, that's the problem with the churches. That's the problem with church hopping. People leave a situation and go to a new situation. And the pastor doesn't do his due diligence and figure out where you're about. You can cause the same problem or worse in the new church. 
When people walk in the door, I remember we had, uh, what well, was probably a year ago, and two individuals came out of the blue. No idea who they were, don't understand. They walked in, and I'm like, hey, what are you doing here? And they were like, well, we came to come to church. Great, where are you from? How are you doing? Where are you from? Right? And at the end, the, the, and they were older couple, they were the veterinarian couple that was here, if you guys remember. But uh, the, the, the guy was like, um, you know, I thought it was odd, but now that I've heard you, I understand what you did. I'm like, yeah, I'm protecting my flock. I don't know you. I just want to get a, a beat on why you're here. Most churches don't care. They're happy you're here, and you're going to put money in the plate. It's not our gig. It's not our gig. And then it gets to the point where, you know, we've had people say they're not allowed to go to these other churches because they have a, a track record of causing issues. Well, those issues would have all been dealt with right up front if you just had a conversation with people when they walked in. Matthew 13, for this people's heart has grown callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. These people's hearts have grown callous. Well, you, as members in the church, are just as responsible as me. If someone new walks into this church, we need to go have a conversation with them. How are you doing? What are you about? Where do you come from? Love to have you here. Gracious, welcoming, but at the same time, checking. Because we're in the end. We're in the 12th, we're in the midnight hour. We don't want to get caught unaware, somebody coming in. Every church should be doing this. And I don't believe that they are. All right, then he goes on. He says, just as uh, Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers opposed the truth. I'm not going to read all of the stuff you can make highlight of here, but who are these two guys that he's talking about? Most theologians believe these are the two magicians that confronted Aaron and Moses at the time of Exodus in front of Pharaoh. Remember? They showed up, and Moses said, hey, God says you need to let my people go and let me show a sign, and I'll throw a, my staff on the ground, and it turns into a snake. And Pharaoh goes, so what? He talks to these two guys, Jonas and Jambres, and he says, prove to him that's nothing. And they throw down their staffs, and they took turn into a snake. So, you know, that was no big deal, except, you know, they kind of sweep the thought that Aaron's snake ate them. But let's not go there. You can do that, I can do that. That was kind of the idea. And then they talked about, he next day he says, hey, my, let my people go, and if you don't, I'm going to turn the water to blood. Really? Jonas and John, you could, boop, and they turn it to blood too. No big deal. And the next day, it was, well, if you don't do that, I'm going to give you frogs. Hey, Jonas and John, you no problem. They came and made frogs. So basically the whole idea was, your God is nothing. We can do it too, even though Moses and Aaron were doing it by the power and only through the power of God, and the other two were doing it by magic, sleight of hand, or the enemy, right, who gave them some sort of power. But it eventually got to a point where they could no longer fight with God, and we'll, we'll pick that up. It says that those two guys, because they were able to compete with Moses and Aaron. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected, but they will not get very far because as in every case, or oh, sorry, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. So he's talking about the false teachers and he's, he's making a comparison to the two magicians and he's saying they have depraved minds and they're going to get away for a while, but at some point their folly will come and be... Uh, uh, present to everyone. You won't miss this, right? If you just hang around long enough, you will see this happening. Well, how did it happen with the two magicians? So back in Exodus, it said, then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats. They did this. And when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to produce the gnats, their secret arts, they could not. So they did the first three. They turned a thing into snake, and they made blood, and 
out of the water and they basically produce some frogs, but then it stops. They couldn't produce the gnats. They couldn't produce the flies. They couldn't produce a plague on the livestock. They couldn't produce a, a, a plague of boils or a plague of hail or locusts or darkness. And they couldn't produce the plague on the firstborn. Their folly became evident to everyone around. Well, let me help you what was going on here, right? Remember, uh, Moses was basically a uh, adopted son of Pharaoh, and he kills a, 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 an Egyptian because he was attacking a Jew, Jewish person, and he runs into the desert, and he stays there, and God says, I got a plan for you. No, 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 I don't want to go. Yeah, 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 you're going to go. Tell him I am sent you. I want him to release my people. So he comes back. Now, Israel is sitting here. Do you think they believe Moses? Really? Do you really believe they thought Moses was telling the truth? He was just another wacko, just like anyone else. So God had to prove Moses was who he was. And this is where the battle happened. Well, Moses did this miracle, no, so didn't they. And they did that miracle, and so didn't they. He did that miracle, and so didn't they. You think the Jewish people were really like, oh, yeah, he's really from God. Well, if he could do it and they could do it, what? But then God continues. And there was no doubt by the time they got to the firstborn, because all of the Israelites basically got the message, hey, you need to slaughter a lamb, and you need to paint your door. Otherwise, you have a problem. And they did. And they did it. Because they were finally convinced. But the false teachers, nothing. Right? The false teachers of today, when you push them into healing somebody on the fly, yeah, they can't do it. No one can. Not one piece of evidence anywhere has anyone done that. No one has raised anybody from the dead, although there have been rumors in the world that there are guys raising people from the dead. It's just not the truth. Yet we, as gullible individuals, Christians, people that want to see this as real, will believe it. And we'll give them all our money. And we'll give them all our worship. And we'll give them all our time. And God says, don't don't follow that stuff. It's supposed to happen. And it's even going to look real, but don't follow that. And that's where we're going to end here, because remember, Jesus says at the time, if anyone says you look, here's the Messiah, that or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. You already know the message, so there shouldn't be an excuse for you here following anyone out there that's claiming to have some magic power or great following or great whatever. No. This shouldn't be an excuse for you. I think, you know, my heart of heart is we we need to share this message with those around us that are still following these crazies, that are still pushing the signs and wonders as such a major part of who they are, when in reality, it had a purpose. But ultimately, where's your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone? My faith can't be in what I see. My faith can't be in what I do. My faith can only be that I believe Jesus came to the world, that he died for me, that he was put in the ground for three days, that he was raised from the dead, and that he will come back and get me. Because why? Because he said so. That's the only thing that saves me. Not the fact that I can speak in tongues, or I can heal people, or I can be rich, or I can do any of this. That doesn't save you. It just doesn't. And we put too much energy there. Amen? Father, we thank you for...